Uh, John chapter 6, it is my honor and privilege to invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John once again. We are in John chapter 6, as we have been for the last three weeks. We'll be for, uh, Lord willing, one or two more weeks in John 6. I'm sure you'll forgive me. It is a 71 verse long chapter, and there's just too many good things there to just breeze through it. So uh, we're kind of marinating in this chapter, and that's a good thing. Um, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, there's a pew Bible uh, in the, there's a Bible in the pew ahead of you. You're, you're welcome to follow along if you like. They're on page 892 of the pew Bible. I'll uh, go ahead and read the passage uh, this morning, and then we will work our way through it verse by verse, and uh, I'll pray at the end, and we will celebrate the Lord's table uh, together. John chapter 6, beginning at verse uh, 41, and uh, reading down to verse 51. So the Jews grumbled about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Let's pray together. He who has ears, let him hear. Lord and Father, give us ears. so that we would hear the words you speak. And help us now, Holy Spirit, to understand the words of Jesus. Take what is of him and declare it to us. Share him with us. Let us hear him, let us see him, Let us believe in him. May we be convicted of our sins. And may we turn to Christ alone, who has given up his flesh for the life of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Biogerontology is the field of study that seeks to understand and to reverse condition called senescence. Senescence is terminal, and you all have it, because senescence is the word that means biological aging, the gradual deterioration of the functions of your body. Senescence happens because those little parts of your body called cells, they get sloppy when they reproduce themselves. Eventually, they become sloppy enough that your body has to step in and say, stop reproducing because you're getting sloppy and you age. Biogerontologists have identified several things which cause cellular senescence. One of them is food. Ironically, calories give life and cause death. 
Every time a cell reproduces, it becomes less able to do it again. And scientists have elongated the life of mammals by up to 30% simply by starving them. Well, in the quest of elongating human life, you can imagine starvation is a hard sell. Turns out, however, there is a food that gives life and extends life forever. But it's not the kind of food that you would think, and you don't eat it in the same way you might think. This is a different kind of food. The title of my sermon this morning is Food for Life. And the main idea I take from the closing phrase in, the, in our passage, if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Food for life. Now, as I said, we've been in John 6 for three weeks, and the subject matter of this whole chapter has really been about food, bread to be specific, but not the kind of bread like you eat with peanut butter and jelly, a different kind of bread. And this all, this discussion about bread, it began with a, a, a crowd about half the size of Piqua who got hungry, and the only food they could find was a, from a little kid's lunchbox. And so they were hungry. A similar crisis happened last weekend at the church picnic. Um, we had ordered something like 300 chicken strips, and uh, as we saw y'all line up, and then I looked at the hungry in your eyes, we channeled the disciple Philip, and we decided this ain't gonna be enough food uh, for everyone. So, regrettably, your pastor does not have the ability to multiply chicken strips as Jesus might have. So we had to leave, and we, we, we did, it might have been a miracle, we, we handed a thin little piece of plastic to a person who then handed us chicken, uh, but we were able to come back, and you were able, hopefully, I pray, to eat to your fill. And afterwards, we gathered up the leftover fragments into baskets. There, I didn't count them, there were probably 12 of them, I don't know, um, but in any case, I didn't do a miracle, but Jesus did a miracle for this hungry crowd. He fed a crowd, and many came back to Jesus. This made him very popular, as you might imagine. But they were coming to Jesus after that, not because they wanted to see Jesus, but because they wanted more bread. And Jesus used that opportunity to teach these people that the bread that he made for their physical needs was just symbolic, a metaphor of the bread that he is for their spiritual needs. The bread that Jesus gives is the bread that Jesus is. He taught that he alone was the all-satisfying provider and the provision of all that they would ever need. And if they had come to Christ, they would never cease to be satisfied in Jesus because Jesus is infinitely satisfying. God's people, we learned, were given to Jesus by God the Father, satisfied in Jesus, and Jesus will keep them safe. We learned this last week that the rock-solid foundation of your eternal security is in God the Son's obedience to God the Father. You were given to God the Son, and God the Father went to God the Son and said, keep them, and he said, I will keep them. So you are as safe in Christ as Christ is obedient to his Father, which is pretty safe. Well, that's been John 6 so far, and I don't know about you, but as I have meditated on these truths, I have found them to be tremendously life-giving, tremendously fear-eradicating, and tremendously confident-building. Now the Lord hones in on another element of those who are in Christ, another element of this sort of life-giving, fear-melting, confidence-building element of the gospel. And it happens through an objection from some folks that John calls the Jews. It is a term that John usually uses to refer to religious leaders. They take issue with Jesus, calling himself the bread that came down from heaven. So the first thing that Jesus teaches us, he teaches us three things as far as I can tell. Now, this is the first thing. Believers are drawn to God to come to Jesus. So lean into verse 41 and following and we'll see if we can follow where the Lord is going. So the Jews grumbled about Jesus because Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. You see, in Israel's history, they went into the wilderness, and they didn't have any food in the wilderness, and so God sent bread from heaven to kind of fall and kind of show up on the ground, and they went out and they gathered bread, and that's what kept them alive in the wilderness. They called this bread manna. 
And Jesus is saying, um, the bread that came from heaven, the, gre- the bread that God said, that was me. I am the bread from heaven. That's a pretty lofty claim. And they had a problem with this. I mean, how can you say that? This is, this is Jesus. His father's Joe. Like, we play cards on Friday night down at the club. His mom is on the PTA with my wife, and his, his sister is friends with my daughter. This is Jesus. I know this guy. He's not from heaven. He's from Nazareth. It's in Galilee. I can take you there. And so they have a problem with Jesus because he's saying, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. But they can't see that because all they see is he's not the son of God. He's the son of Joseph. Their problem was blindness. It was the same problem, by the way, that the crowd had with Jesus. See, the crowd was blinded from seeing the true Jesus because all they could see him as is the the fish and bread guy that they wanted to make their king. You see, they were blinded by their belly, what they wanted to get out of Jesus. They wanted Jesus to make them more bread. They wanted Jesus to give them an easy life. Well, the the religious leaders, they had the same problem as the crowd, except their blindness was their religion. This was not the son of God, but the son of Joseph. Jesus claimed he was bread, sent by God to give eternal life. And when you follow his dialogue in John 6, you find that he gives away this eternal life for free. There's just nothing you have to do. You just have to come to Jesus and believe in Jesus, and then you'll have eternal life. Jesus is teaching something that we now call salvation by grace through faith. And this cornerstone is offensive to religious people. Grace is offensive to religious people. You see, this is because religious people see God as if he lived atop a mountain. And every person exists at the base of the mountain. And these religious people believe that God had given a very specific set of instructions to the Jewish people on how they were to make their way up the mountain. As far as they could understand it, the better they were at obeying those instructions, the further they climbed up the mountain, the closer they were to the God atop the mountain. This system, which we call religion, this is a very comfortable system. Listen, everyone in this room likes that system very much. The system of do this and this will happen, it is very manageable. It's very controllable. It's measurable. It's a very comfortable system. We like this system very much. The economics make sense. If I do this for God, then I get this from God. It gives us a sense of control over our outcomes. If there's something that I want from God, I know the plan, the things that I can do to get it from Him. But if my life ends up with something I don't like, then I can look backwards and say, I did this, and this was the result, therefore next time I'll make corrections, and that will happen to me again. It's very manageable. It's very controllable. It's very fair. More than that, though, here's what religion does. We appreciate religion because it gives us the ability to measure others. We not only see ourselves on the side of the mountain, we can look at others below us and say, they're below us. And we can act in such a way that they can look up to us and say, you're above me. And we like that very much. But that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. The message of the gospel God is on top of a proverbial mountain. And you are at the base of this mountain. But here's where the metaphors break apart. No one is trying to climb the mountain up to God. 
The Bible says that we are dead in our sin and trespasses. And dead people, in my experience, don't climb mountains. People who are not believers, they don't want God. They don't want to come to the light. Do you remember what Jesus said earlier in John? Or do you know what John said earlier in John? Is that they, they love the darkness. They don't want the light. They don't want to climb the mountain. They don't want to go where God is. Romans 3, no one seeks for God. No, not one. Not even one person does good. The message of the gospel is that if God is atop a mountain, we are at the base of the mountain, this God wrapped himself in flesh and came down off the mountain down to where we are and he gave us life and he placed us on his back and he carried us up the mountain. That's what the gospel teaches. Not that we have to climb our way up the mountain, but that God carried us. His son carried us up the mountain all of him, all of his power, all of his grace. And religion hates that message because this message of the gospel, it strips every man, woman, and child of their boast. It eliminates our ability to compare ourselves to one another because it levels the playing field. No one deserves to be here. No, not one. We are all equally powerless. And grace is unmanageable. When you have a God who comes off of the mountain and carries you on his back up the top of a mountain, that's, that's not controllable. That's not manageable. Because if, listen, if he's carrying us on his back up the mountain, then he can, he can carry you wherever he wants to carry you. <laughs> and you don't care. You don't get a, he can carry you to China. He can carry you to Congo. He can carry you to Turkey. He can carry you to Piqua or Honda. He can carry you through marital unfaithfulness. He can carry you through infertility. He can carry you through wounds. He can carry you through hurt. He can carry you through cancer. And all of his carrying is for your good because it goes up the mountain. Well, religion doesn't like that message. And so they don't like that Jesus teaches grace for free. And this may be the reason why Jesus gives us this answer in verse 43. Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You don't climb the mountain on your own. I come to you. And I will raise him up on the last day. No one finds God. God finds us. You see what Jesus is saying is that if you are in Christ, you're in Christ because God gave you to Jesus, because God drew you to Jesus. And you stay in Christ because Jesus is keeping you in Jesus. All of this, by the way, of grace. And this is what religion doesn't understand. You don't get right by God by doing right by God because no one does right by God. You get right by God by trusting in the only one who did do right by God. And therefore... You get right by God. The opposite of religion is not secularism. It's grace. Drawn by God, we come to Jesus. And we gave him no reasons to do this. He did it all on his own, all of grace. And it means those who are his, those of you who are trusting in Christ, you, are, you belong to God but you are undeserving of that grace. You are ill-deserving of that grace. It was all God's sovereign grace. So now Jesus turns and explains how this happened, taught by God to believe in Jesus. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, the Lord says, and they will be taught by God, all of them, everyone, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. 
So look at these verses and trace the actions of God through those three verses. Taught by God the Father, hear God the Father, learn God the Father, come to God the Son and believe for eternal life. Taught of God, heard from God, learned from God, come to Jesus. All of grace, all of God. What stands out to me in these verses is the centrality of God's word. Notice the centrality of the scriptures in God's plan of salvation. Those three words, taught and heard and learned, they all relate to God speaking, knowledge, not feeling, knowledge. While everyone in the world, regardless of where they grow up, whether it's China or Congo, wherever they grow up, they have a knowledge, they have a certain knowledge of God that God has placed in creation and in their conscience. But in order to be right with God, in order to be uh, reconciled to God, you have to have faith. And faith, the Bible says, comes how? By hearing. And hearing what? The Word of God. God always uses His Word to give life. If you remember from the first chapter in the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth by speaking. Let there be, and there was. God breathed life into the first man, the breath from His mouth. He gives eternal life in the very same way. 1 Peter 1, 23, you have been born again, by the living and abiding Word of God, the Bible, God speaking. And this is why we place a premium on God's Word in this church, simply because my words don't have life. Don't ever rely on my words for life. Rely on God's Word for life. And I will endeavor week by week to preach his word as it is, the best as I understand it, the enabling of God's Holy Spirit to preach God's word because that's where life is. And week after week, we will encourage you to read the Bible. And this is why almost everything we do, probably everything we do is centered around the scriptures. Wednesday nights, we teach a class on how to understand the Bible. Our Living Stones discipleship groups, they gather around the Bible. God's word must not be peripheral in your life or in this ministry. It must be central in this ministry and in your life. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon famously said that you show me a man whose Bible is falling apart and I will show you a man whose life isn't. And I think that's right. If you're spiritually weak, it's because you're biblically malnourished. God uses his word to give us life. And he uses his word to keep us having life. Imagine the next time you take a flight, as you reach cruising altitude, the pilot gets on the intercom and says, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached cruising altitude and we've made this flight 500 times before in the same aircraft and we've never had a problem, not even once. These engines have never failed us. Therefore, the crew and I have decided we don't need them anymore. We're going to cut the engines. What do you think is going to happen at that moment? A panic and then a crash, right? Because physics takes over. An 800,000 pound metal tube suddenly loses its magical ability to fly through the air. And it will crash. Its track record notwithstanding, it will crash. The only way an 800,000 pound piece of metal floats is because of those two engines and the wings and the lift created. Gravity is still working on that airplane the entire time it flies. It's just that a stronger force has been introduced than gravity and it floats. It's the same thing in your life. The Bible is that stronger force. But if you cut the engine, gravity takes over, your sin takes over, your flesh takes over, and you fall to the ground. So much of the Christian life has a very simple premise. 
Read the Bible and don't stop. So here's what I recommend. It's not complicated. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Memorize the Bible. Teach the Bible. Pray the Bible. Sing the Bible. Share the Bible. If you want to know about God, go to the Bible. If you want to know what God is like, what he thinks about you, go to the Bible. If you want to know how God feels about you, you go to the Bible. If you want to hear God speak, you go to the Bible. If you want to hear God speak out loud, read it out loud. It's really that simple. God's word is God speaking. Be taught by God. Hear from God and learn about God from the Bible. And in so doing, you will come to Christ, believe in Christ, and you will have eternal life. Believers are drawn by God to Jesus. Believers are taught by God to believe in Jesus. And last point, sent from God, life comes from Jesus. Verse 48, I am the bread of life, Jesus said. Your fathers, they ate man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. We're going to save that last phrase for the end. Coming in this passage in John 6, and I think probably through the whole gospel of John, coming and believing and eating, they're synonymous. I don't think the Lord means for us to infer some kind of like progression, you know, like as if coming to Jesus is not the same as believing and not the same as eating. I think they're all the same. Jesus is the bread of life, the living bread, and he's the only bread that gives life. But I think as you're reading through John 6 and as you're memorizing and as you're meditating on this passage, notice the repetition. There's, there's got to be some significance to this. Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. Verse 33, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven to give life to the world. Verse 40, everyone who looks on the Son, believes in him, shall have eternal life. And here, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. If you eat of me, you will live forever. I think the Lord means for us to, some, to know something about the connection between him being bread and eternal life. He tells the religious leaders, your fathers ate manna and they died. They went in the wilderness, they ate the man of God, and they died. That bread sustained them for that day. That, those calories gave them life, but also took it away from them, weakened their cellular regeneration. They were not able to live forever. But this bread, this bread causes you to live forever. You eat of this bread, and you will, eat, you will never die. Now, there's one more, one more treasure that I want you to see in this passage. It's right there at the end, the very last sentence. And it's a curious phrasing. Just lean into this. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Two things I want you to see. First, notice how Jesus changes the tense of his verb. He shifts from a present tense and a past tense to a future tense. The bread that I will give. That's curious. Also notice the word for there. Uh, you may not see this in English. You probably won't. But in the Greek, it's not. It, it, it's the word hyper, which means it means on behalf of. Means for the sake of. So then it would be totally appropriate to read the Lord as saying, I will give the bread that I will give on behalf of the world is my flesh. The bread that I will give on behalf of the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus is saying that sometime in the future, he will give his flesh, his body, in exchange for the life of the world. He'll use that same word, that word that's translated in English as for, again in chapter 10, you read it earlier. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep in place of the sheep. Chapter 15, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for, in place of, his friends. I think the most interesting use of this word appears when high priest Caiaphas, who was not a friend of Jesus by any means, said this, it is better that one man should die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. 
Theologian Karl Barth called this the most important word in the Bible. And it appears in my favorite verse of the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is predicting that in a few short months, he will go to the cross and there he will be beaten and there he will be mocked. He will suffer excruciating pain, suffer excruciating shame, and he will be nailed to a cross and he will asphyxiate and he will die. The one who gives life will have his life taken. The question is why? Why did Jesus do this? Why would Jesus die? Perhaps a better question is, what did Jesus die for? Jesus died for, he says, the life of the world. In exchange for his perfect life, sinners can have eternal life. God took the rebellion of hell-deserving sinners like you and I, and he, he placed them on his son. And he took, in exchange, his perfect life and gave it to those who trust in him. All of this a gift. All of this by grace. This is the bread that Jesus gives. The life that Jesus lived, the bread that Jesus is. Literally, he placed you on his back and he carried you up the mountain. And the reality is those of you who are here who have trusted in Christ, when you get to the top of the mountain on the back of the Lord Jesus, you will hear one of the most preposterous things you'll have ever heard in your entire life. God the Father will look at you and say, well done good and faithful servant. And you will look backwards and you realize, I was carried here. The good, the faithful, he did that and he gave it to me. No religion can offer you a promise like that. No rule keeping can give you a promise like that. But that is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the promise awaiting those who trust in him. And now, if you are in Christ, if you are now trusting in him, that he's carrying you up the mountain, we have the privilege as a community to celebrate the life that J Jesus gave for us at the Lord's table in communion. Corey, will you come back and lead us as we prepare our hearts to take communion? In the early days of gerontology, there was a scientist who wrote, aging and death do seem to be what nature has planned for us, but what if we have other plans? Despite those other plans, that fellow died in 2001 at the age of 76. I'm assuming it was the food that got him. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The question is, when you get to that judgment, who are you trusting? Are you trusting in yourself to make it up that mountain? Because, friend, that's not enough. Or are you trusting in the only one who's ever been to that mountain? the only one who's ever seen God, Jesus Christ. If you are, then I have the privilege of inviting you in a few moments to come forward and to take the juice and the cup and bring it back to your seat. And then together we will celebrate what the Lord has done in shedding his blood and giving his body for us. I need to say, if you're not a Christian, or if you're not sure you're a Christian, that just just pass this time. This is something that we get to do as believers. 
don't want to exclude you from this, but if you don't have a home church and you don't have a pastor in your life or believers around you to confirm that you are a Christian, let's just pass on that. If you have some questions about that, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. It's not a big deal, but I just don't want you to take the Lord's Supper in celebration of something that's not real yet. Hopefully will be one day.